in Wolf County. I know most of you that are here in person. Hello to those of you that are on Zoom. So you all be on your best behavior here because the people on Zoom will hear anything you're saying in the background. Um, but welcome to Wolf County. Welcome to our Mountain Cattlemen's meeting and as the East Kentucky Hay Contest program. Tonight, we will have with us Dr. Jimmy Henning. He's an extension forage specialist for the University of Kentucky. He is going to go over how to interpret your um, hay sample results and um, talk about how important forage quality is for your livestock. So at this time, Dr. Henning, I'm going to turn it over to you. All righty. All righty. I, I can't tell you, I'm a little bit giddy seeing this many live people at one place at one time. So, it, it, you know, I, now I'm sorry about the topic tonight, you know, and sorry about the speaker, but I'm sure glad to see you. Um, I want to, I want to make sure, and you're watching the chat. So if anybody's having any difficulty uh, in the, the uh, I call it the company, right? If, if the company that we're having that are not with us, we're family tonight. Uh, if they're having difficulty, I'm assuming they're going to let you know. So we're good. Okay. Uh, we, uh, we've got two things I want to do tonight. And I'm going to give you the medicine first and the sugar at the end. All right. So we're going to talk about interpreting forage quality results uh, and what that means and how to do it. And uh, when we get, when then I'm going to announce the winners of the hay contest and talk about the hay contest. So how many of you had samples in the hay contest? Anybody? Quite a few, very good. Okay, there we go, okay. Oh, wonderful, all right, so uh, let's get started. Um, so let's talk about interpreting forage quality reports and let's see if I can make this go now. Um, the, <laughs> I was thinking about class uh, it, UK, when it went back to class, they, we had us do uh, what we call hybrid things, which means I've got people online and I got people in the in front of me and things like that. And it was always a trip to get everything working, right? I, the people in the room could hear me talk, but, but oftentimes the, the away, the company could not. So I was, I was trying to get this to actually advance. Uh, and the first slide is, I want you to, to visualize a plant cell and its components. Now, we can stand up because we have a skeleton. We have cells, and, but, the, but the support comes from the skeleton, the, the bones, right? And the tendons and, and things like that. Plants don't have muscles, bones, or tendons. They stand up because they have a cell wall. Uh, and so tonight, the, one of the most important things that I want to impart to you is the idea of that cell wall. All right, now I would wager you haven't probably had many conversations with other farmers about cell walls, right? Um, so you, are you getting those? All right, there you go. Uh, we're having company, company's coming, right? The doorbell's ringing, we're letting them in. Uh, but cell wall is a big deal. And here's, here's the big deal right up front. Ruminants, cattle, the digest fiber, right? Where do they digest the fiber? Anybody. Orville, you're an ag teacher. Where do they, what, what stomach is the fiber digestion occurring? <laughs> okay, fair, fair enough, fair enough. You can grow the stuff. Animal science major in the room. What, what, I'm going to pick on the agent. So Paul Sizemore, where, what, where does that, where does the fiber digestion take place in a, in a cow? In the rumen, the first thing, right? The first place that the forage gets to, right? So that cell wall is fiber and it gets digested in the rumen. Now, I want you to think back to your elementary school days when you could not chew gum in class. I suspect you can do almost anything you wanna do in class anymore. Chewing gum would be one of them. Uh, but we couldn't chew gum in Miss Doris Hockersmith's fourth grade class, right? And, but people did because underneath the desk, right? is the old gum, right? And you knew somebody had chewed gum in that class. Now, I want to talk about chewing gum tonight. And there was a, a brand of chewing gum in the 20th century called Freshen Up Gum. Anybody ever know you bought Freshen Up Gum? Yeah, Liquid Center, right? Wonderful, love, 
Cinnamon was my favorite, right? Loved it. Well, that freshen up cinnamon gum with the liquid center is a perfect analogy for a plant cell, all the way down to the way it's digested. So just, if you, if you don't believe me, just hold on tight. I'll try to convince you, okay? The liquid center, let's talk about that first. If it's good and fresh, then that liquid center is big and it's not dried out and it's sugary and it's, you know, you bite into that and boom, you get a burst of good stuff, right? It is exactly comparable to the cell contents in the middle of a cell, right? So a cell is a cell wall and in the middle is the liquid center, is the sugar and the good stuff, right? It is 100% or, or close enough for government work, digestible, that liquid center, all right? It contains carbohydrates and protein, it's, but it, it can be as little as 35% of the dry matter of a cell of your hay, or as much as 50 or even 60%. So if we stop right here, right now, and you looked at your forage analysis, I, would I could show you where you could find out how big the liquid center is in your hay, okay? And obvious, well, you don't know this yet because I hadn't said it yet, but intuitively, just like gum, you want lots of liquid center, right? Because that means the gum is fresh, it's good, and that's what you want, okay? Let's talk about the chewy outside. If it's good, fresh gum, we're gonna chew on the outside after the liquid center is gone, right? And so we get some sugar out of it. But at some point, all the good is gone and it goes under the desk, right? So that look at outside is just like the cell wall. It is somewhat digestible in the rumen. It's chewing releases sugar, just like the rumen releases in or, you know, digests the, the fiber. And it, the cell wall, not the liquid center, but the cell wall can be as much as 40 to 65% of the hay, okay? Now, I wanna digress a little bit and talk about fiber digestion in the rumen. Okay, so uh, Charles, what <laughs> how, what organisms are digesting fiber in the rumen? Bugs, microbes, I mean, fungi, bacteria, protozoa, crawly things, right? How do they get fed? What do they live on? They live on the liquid center. When, you, when you, your hay hits the rumen, the liquid center gets burst, right? And it's out into the rumen and the bugs, the, the protozoa, the fungi, the bacteria, love it. They eat it up and they, and they grow and they flourish. And then they start looking for something else to eat. What's left to eat? The cell wall, the fiber, right? Now that all works just fine. That's a great system. I mean, that is as elegant a, a, a energy develop, a, digestion system as you will ever find until there's no liquid center. Then what's the, what are the bugs going to live on? A wish and a prayer. Good, good thoughts, right? And that, that actually happens. When we have hay that has lots of cell wall and not much liquid center, then the bugs get hungry and they can't really digest your fiber well. So that's why forage testing is so important because we want as much liquid center in that hay bale as we can in the cell. And we want the fiber to then get digested by the bugs who are happy and well-fed in the rumen, okay? Now, here's a little advanced lesson for you. The older the plant gets, the tougher the cell wall gets. I, I, if I had a piece of paper, I would wave it and I'd say, this is a piece of paper is cellulose. A pine tree is cellulose plus lignin. Now lignin is like the glue that makes a pine tree stand up, right? The resin and things like that. That's not exactly biologically correct, but it's when you have older plant cells, they are very rigid and they are rigid because they're old like me and I can't bend over. And so that's, that's what happens. So, so tonight, when we get into the number part, and I have, and your, your, your eyes are beginning to roll backwards and you're tired of talking about neutral detergent fiber and so on, then think about chewing gum, okay?
All right, so we're gonna vis we're gonna talk about visualizing a plant cell and its digestibility. The liquid center cell contents readily available. Ah, sorry, chewy outside is the total cell wall. The total cell wall is the same as neutral detergent fiber. So if the cell wall is neutral detergent fiber, catchy word, I know, you can hardly ever forget it, probably hardly ever remember it, uh, if, if, then what's good? If we want big liquid center, the neutral detergent fiber needs to be what? High or low? Low, all right? So tonight, or when you go home and you've got your hay analysis, Look at neutral detergent fiber. I, I would wager it is it would be the last number you go and look at on your forage report. But I, I would I could argue that I could tell more about your forage from the neutral detergent fiber than any other line on your forage report because it tells me how much liquid center I have. Got it? All right. So NDF is the cell wall, and we want that number as low as possible so that we can have the biggest liquid center. Okay, let's keep moving. All right, now the agents by and large took all these samples, but a good, but a sampling is really a big deal. In order to, to have a good forage test, it starts with a good forage sample and it has to represent the hay to be that you're trying to feed. And we call that group of hay a lot, which is a hay that is, Basically, the same field, the same treatment, the same species is as good as it can be. You know, it's going to be, you know, it's not mixing two different fields, two different kinds of forages. We want to take core samples, 15 to 20 bales, and the whole sample needs to be sent to the lab. Now, when you send it to the lab, you're going to have to specify wet chemistry or the other one is near infrared reflective spectroscopy. This will not be on your test, so you can relax. But we use near infrared reflectance spectroscopy to test your, to analyze your samples. Why? It's faster, it's non destructive, and we can get about 25 different measures from that one scan. And what we do is we grind up the tissue and we stick it under a lamp that's given, that's putting out near infrared light. So near infrared, I won't even try to think about what that is right here on the spot. I paid to know that at one time, but it, it won't be on my test either tonight. But uh, so, you know, that reflectance then tells the computer what your hay sample is because it's got a database of other samples just like it, right? And that have had wet chemistry run on. So therefore, just like your eye, when you see a good cow, you know, when you look at that cow, conformation, thickness, you know, how well they can walk, uh, size, how fat they are, how thin they are, you're able to see it and, and know something. The computer's the same way with NIR. And the good thing is it can give us about 25 different things at one time. There would be no way on God's green earth we could take those 515 samples, Charles, take them to Princeton and run them in a week if we were all doing wet chemistry, because every single analysis is separate. They would do the proteins, then we would do fibers and so on, okay? So we used NIR and moving on. Now, I, I, I really am passionate about this topic because I ran a mobile A testing lab at the University of Missouri for about three years and I would take the sample, I would grind the sample, I would analyze the sample, I would print the results and I would hand them to a farmer and I thought I was done. Was I done? No, I was not done. What, what did they ask me? What does it mean? Is they would, it literally, that you're looking at a picture of farmers that I had just handed a result to, right? And this happened every single time. Uh, that if I'm handing them the number, and they would hand it back to me and they said, well, is this any good? Is this any good? And so I realized, and of course I was brand new. I mean, green is grass, certifiably dangerous as a new professional. And you could probably use the word professional loosely in my context. I had to do a lot of work to try to help understand how do I explain that to people? Because we're about to launch off into a bunch of terms about fiber and things that are not your everyday language. Okay, 
But so here's what, what I'm giving you is the benefit of 40 years of, of experience trying to explain whether hay is good or not. And you can tell me later if, or maybe not, if uh, you know my 40 years was wasted, okay? Now, I'm, I pulled this off the top of your hay analysis. This is what we would print on, on your hay analysis. You're gonna have your name, your county, the sample number that we identify it with, whether it's a round bale, square bale, a little more about the, uh, the hay itself, uh, and then whether it's hay or silage, and then the dry matter uh, as we receive the sample, okay? And of course, haylage or silage will be anything from, oh, 40% dry matter to 60% dry matter, but hay is probably gonna be 10 to 15% dry matter. So that's the top part. All right, but the business end of it is this. You're gonna have the total score, which is CP plus RFV, that's crude protein plus relative feed value. Then there's a relative feed value, crude protein, A, D, F, and NDF, fiber numbers, okay? Big deal. Not your favorite number on this report, I can assure you, because what is your what is the most intuitive number on this report that you've heard of us talk about yet so far? Protein, exactly. We, we know when you want a steak, you pay more than when you get corn, right? Or baked potato. Baked potato is carbohydrates, steak is protein. With forage crops, it's, the, it's exactly backwards. The forage plant can make a lot of protein. It has a hard time having a lot of energy because energy means a small cell wall and a big liquid center, okay? So intuitively, yes, protein is good, but that's not the limiting factor. Let's go on down the list. Here's one I know you've probably never seen before and we're good with acronyms IVTDMD30%. I, any agent know what that is? Stump the band, right? IV in vitro, which means the same thing Latin is under glass. T for true, DMD is dry matter digestibility. So in vitro, true dry matter digestibility at 30, 30 hours. So this, that number is to estimate the digestibility in the rumen of that cell wall, that whole cell plant, the whole cell, plant cell at 30 hours. Why 30 hours? Well, that's just a little over a day. How often do cows eat? Daily, weekly, all the time, right? All the time. So we, we really have to have food going through them, right? We really have a problem if it hangs around in the room in more than a day, don't we? We then start losing weight because that means that the liquid center is small, the bugs are not there, the cell wall is hanging around and the cow is not getting anything or very much. And so we want the IVT DMD at 30 hours because that really is a good number to tell us how digestible that plant, wall, that plant cell is. So in this case, this is 54.8, which is pretty good. It's, it's average, I would say, okay? Now I skipped over TDN, total digestible nutrients. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. I don't need to belabor that. Ash is the total amount of minerals in the, in the sample. Uh, that matters because if you, how many of you use wheel rakes? Everybody uses wheel rakes. Anybody have something else besides a wheel rake? What do you have? A bar rake, outstanding. Anybody have a rotary rake? No kidding. How about that? How, that's amazing. Rotary rakes and bar rakes don't have to hit the ground in order to, to drive the crop into a windrow. And so therefore you can adjust them so that they don't hit the dirt, right? Now wheel rakes don't have that option. They typically have to get pretty close to the ground and sometimes touch the ground in order to move the forage to the windrow. Right? That's how they work, right? They're passive. They, they're driven by the forage hitting those, those tines at an angle, right? What we have found by looking at the ash number is that when we get crops grown in rows with bare ground between them, like sorghum Sudan, like small grains, when you get a bottom field that gets flooded and it's got a lot of trash and it gets into the, you know, the cutting, your ash number goes up. So a lot of, I will say a lot of the time, but some of the time looking at a forage analysis, it's some time away from the time you bale that hay and looked at it in the field. That ash number gives you a clue of 
how am I raking? You know, how much trash have I got in the field? Do I have a problem or not? Now, I will tell you a little secret. The reason why it has gotten to be a big deal to me is I've, I've worked a lot with baleage in the last four years. That's round bale silage. Number one concern that most people have when they talk about round bale silage, you know, moist hay, plastic wrap, and so on, is botulism. Botulism is called by a, caused by a clostridium bacteria. Where does the clostridium bacteria come from? Soil, by and large, dirt. Uh, that's where the, the clostridia soil uh, bacteria are. A, a standing forage crop standing there has almost no clostridium on it at all. So the fact that we use wheel rakes, and we can, that's not against the law, but that ash number then becomes really important to you. You want it to be 11% or less, and I haven't looked at this, this is 11.9. So it's kind of, you know, I, I bet if we talk to, uh, Linda's on the line, so maybe if we quiz Bruce Atkins, you know, about that sample, maybe maybe it would, it's just what it is. You know, 11 is still in the in the range of normal, sort of. But if we were, had, you know, if it was so much higher, then you would begin to say, what happened? You know, am I doing something I could improve on? Because obviously moving dirt into the bale is, is leaving room for improvement, which is my personal motto, by the way, leaving room for improvement. Uh, <clears throat> then we've got calcium, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, okay? We will not spend a lot of time on those tonight uh, because a lot of times the minerals, even though we can measure them in that plant cell, they're in the fiber. And they, they're not really what we call bioavailable. So when, as a cattleman and cattle woman, then your mineral mix is incredibly important. We have uh, typically forage crops have a lot more calcium than phosphorus. Grain crops, it's the opposite. But we don't necessarily depend on those minerals to do very much for our cattle diet, OK? All right, now, one thing I meant to say, and I don't have it in the, in the slides, and that is that I, when I tested, we ran, we did that hay testing service at Missouri. We started, we asked, we did a survey of producers in Missouri, a thousand of them. And we asked them, do you test hay? Why, if yes, why? If not, why not? 90% did not test hay. And I would say that percent is probably a lot, not much different in some parts of Kentucky. And when we, and I've, oh, and I've been baffled. Well, and I, we asked them, why not? And they said, because there was no need. And I thought about that. And I thought, there is no need. Why would they say there is no need? I, and I've, I've come to a couple of conclusions. That, it, that is, <clears throat> it, they've always made hay just like that. And they know how to feed it, right? So I don't need your help. You know, I'm good. Thank you very much. And, and it was only $10 to analyze the sample at the time. So, you know, they, that was what they thought. Uh, the other one is, I know that my hay is bad. I don't need to pay somebody to tell me that my hay is bad, right? And that they've got a point. But I want to tell you, in my opinion, there are very, very few bad hays. There are some really bad diets made from hay. So if you made first cutting grass and it was June the 1st or June the 15th, and you know it was late, and I know it was late, and the book says it was late, but it feeds your dry cows just fine, and that's what that hay has to do. It's good hay. It does what it's supposed to do. Where we get into problems with hay and not knowing is when it doesn't do what you expect it to do. And that's why hay testing is so important. You don't want to be surprised after your cows have lost condition, and perhaps you have to post one of them at the diagnostic lab, or they don't rebreed, or they just have troubles because they're thin. Okay, that's that's a that's the wrong way to find out your hay is not good. Okay, all right, let's move on. We got a lot of ground to cover. All right, to understand reports, we have to understand the diff the relationship between fiber and energy. This is high fiber and 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 low energy shredded wheat. Your favorite, I know, right? This is my favorite. Low fiber and high energy, right? Same thing applies at liquid center. I want the biggest liquid center with the littlest cell wall I can get. That's what I want, right? And so we want things more like briar ice cream than shredded wheat. And my job tonight is to explain to you the numbers so you know whether your forage is like one or the other, right? That's, that's my job. All right, so the main fiber terms, neutral detergent fiber. 
and I'll just go through this. That's the total fiber in the plant. That's the cell wall. That's the chewy outside of the gum. It's cellulose, hem hemicellulose and lignin. It's used to predict intake. Our little simple forage balancing tool at UK uses NDF, neutral detergent fiber, to predict intake. And if you think of it, you, it's the more fill you've got, then the less a cow can eat. They're, they're full fast, right? Now, ADF is a subset of NDF. It is basically, the, it's supposed to be chemically, the indigestible fiber in the plant, all right? So it's composed of cellulose and lignin. It is used to predict TDN, which may be the most important number on the whole sheet. So therefore, I can, I can argue that NDF, which predicts intake, ADF, which predicts digestibility, tell you more about your forage than any, any other part, anything else, if, if it's just, if it's a normal hay that we ordinarily raise. So TDN, the most important value on the report, a calculated estimate, and realize that we, can, we, we, can, we measure some very abstract things. We measure percent nitrogen and we, we, me, we estimate food protein. We measure fiber and we estimate energy. We measure more fiber and we estimate intake. So the things that are directly related to the animal performance, we do not measure directly. We have to, to measure something else and predict the other, okay? TDN goes up, now I should say TDN goes down as ADF goes up when the crop gets more mature. All right, and energy is the most limiting thing in forage diets. Crude protein, which we intuitively understand, Estimate of, this is the estimate of protein in a forage, now estimate, right? And we call it crude protein because we, we measure percent nitrogen and multiply by 6.25. That works just fine if every bit of nitrogen in that plant is in a real piece of protein, is in steak, or it's in something real. What happens when you fertilize with nitrogen and the plant takes it up but can't process it into real protein? You get an artificial boost in crude protein because it comes up, it's in the plant. If you were to cut hay the next day, but that's not, that's not the way timing usually works, you can get an artificially high number for crude protein, okay? So that's why we call it crude protein, not real protein. And I think, yeah, there we go. It combines real and non-protein nitrogen, or its diets will be limited by energy before they're limited by protein. Now, relative feed value. It's an index of quality for comparing similar forages. You can compare grasses to grasses and, and, and legumes to legumes and mixed to mixed, but you can't uh, compare across because 100 RFV for alfalfa is pretty poor. 100 RFV for a grass hay is smoking good, okay? So you have to compare within categories. The RFV is, let's just see what comes up. It's an index for ranking based on digestibility or TDN and intake. So we take ADF and we take NDF and we, and we calculate RFV, all right? We, it's a calculated number and it's a good way to know right off the bat whether your hay is you know, in the elite or in the average or maybe not so good, okay? Now you gotta look further to see why that is and how well it's gonna work for you, but an RFV is a good way to categorize hays. Calculated from ADF, NDF, the higher the RFV, the better the quality. And the RFV of plume alfalfa is about 100. All right, neutral detergent fiber that we talked about already, total cell wall, it's the chewy outside of the gum, right? It's used to estimate intake, that's its claim to fame. We want low numbers and low NDF, means we've got a very immature forage. So low NDF values indicate livestock can also consume more of it, right? And low NDF comes from less mature forage. ADF is the indigestible fiber used to calculate TDN correlated with energy, but reversely correlated. If, if ADF is high, our energy is low, that's shredded wheat, right? That's shredded wheat. Energy is gonna be low. The ADF in Briar's ice cream is darn low right? And the energy is out of sight. So we, within practical bounds, the, the plant has to stand up. So we have to have some fiber, right? So we, you know, we've got to find that, that happy medium. And I really don't have it built into this presentation, but what the heck is the happy medium for cutting hay? Well, when do you cut hay? 
when the weather is right. That's exactly right. And you, and you know, you've got time with everything else going on in your life. Now, if, if you're from a guy like my point of view, from my point of view, you know, and the textbook point of view, it's going to say, cut hay when, at, uh, when the, the plant is going from vegetative to reproductive. In other words, boot to early head or first flower in the game. So that's, that's the textbook definition. And then you lay on top of that the rest of your world and you do the best you can with what, with what you got. It's one of the reasons why I love crops like alfalfa or orchard grass or, or the mix, because we most of the time first cutting is a, is a roll of the dice. Either the rain gets it or you know whatever, but we get a second chance and sometimes a third chance. And that's when the weather is better. And that's when we can get some really premium quality haze. But the stage of maturity at cutting is the big deal. You know, it's a big deal. Now, if I was really gonna be mean, I would call Heather out and I would say, Heather, what are the three ways that hay is better after you cut it than before you cut it, than standing there? But I'm not mean, but she can just worry about me calling her out later on that a little bit. So that was on the test too, wasn't it, Heather? Yes, it was. So if you're curious, I can tell you. Heather can probably tell you. Okay. Now I did put together this and it's, I'm gonna hand it to you. So, you know, this is a, a, a slide full of numbers. Uh, this is a cheat sheet and it, it gives you three categories of forage quality, high, medium, and low. And I give you estimates or number ranges for if you've got a grass hay, for example, and whoops, let me go back here. Grass and small grains. If you've got a relative feed value of more than a hundred, then that's smoking good, that's hot, that's really good. But for it to be in the same category in alfalfa, it's gotta be 140 or better, okay? And the same thing goes for protein at the bottom, TDN at the upper right, and then ADF and NDF is, is a little conglomerated down in the corner. But I'll let you, Heather is, Heather is passing out the one page cheat sheet, I think with this table on it. Is, it got the, is this the table? Okay, good, all right. So that's, that's something to think about later. And ideally take, your, take a hay test that you've done and then find your number on this page. And you'll know these are arbitrary uh, categories, but they, they are defendable categories to know whether you know, you've got an elite hay, an average hay or dry cow hay, right? All right. And remember there are very few bad hays. There are a whole lot of bad diets. Okay, so. The moment, you know, we've been waiting to get to the results and that's what's next. So let me hurry up. But, you know, a, a good hay test or a good hay testing, doing a good job with it starts with a good sample. We have to interpret the results. Otherwise, it's a page full of numbers. And you get, and then the best way to do that is really trying to figure out how well does it balance a diet for a given set of animals. And remember that the best indicator of forage quality is how well the animals eat it. Right, and that's intake and that's NDF, right? Since now you're totally understanding what NDF and intake is, right? And digestibility, and that's ADF, TDN, energy, okay? And you, so in other words, if we get a hay test and it's supposed to keep cows at a certain level, feed a, feed a cow at a certain level of production, and they, you start noticing she's, either the hay is not disappearing, your intake is not good, or the cow is beginning to, to ball, she's maybe losing a little condition, that tells you that there's more to the story than just the chemical test. And there absolutely is more to the story than, this, than a single chemical test. Okay, all right. Now, the hate contest results. The first thing I need to do is say a bunch of thanks because we had 515 samples. Miss Rebecca Kanopka, who's not on, Rebecca, are you online? She'd be with Philip. Um, she, well, I'm on, I'm on, she is on. Okay, well, we're going to talk about Rebecca later, but Rebecca did a good job, and, and the agents did a huge job with, with taking all these samples and getting them not just taken. They had to deliver them to the station, to our cars. They had to dry them. They had to grind them and then get them packaged up for me so we could take them to Princeton to, be, to run on our NIR, right? So that is about a week's worth of work, uh, and it is not very exciting either. It is not fun whatsoever to stand in front of a grinder for eight hours. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it builds character. So 
also at the our car station that uh, this, they've been generous with their time, with their dryers, with their space. Uh, and I wanted to thank them. The agents that took the samples, ground the samples, the county staff. <laughs> there are 515 samples, folks, and every, and there is a spreadsheet from Hades that they that fill out for your sample, your address, what kind of hay it is, where is it, and so on and so forth. Uh, and if in your county, somebody entered those data values, right? Uh, and so if you see them, I know the agents are grateful, uh, but they, they entered the data. Dr. Toich, Chris Toich in Princeton has the, the lab that runs the NIR and he and Brittany Hendricks uh, processed all those samples. They did it in a week. And then we've got uh, our specialist in Lexington that help us develop rations should you want that. So we had 515 overall samples, 468 samples in the contest itself, 17 different counties. That's up from 15 counties last year. And you've got this in your hand, so I won't go through that. The overall quality average and range, and I'll, I'll give you this uh, in a handout in just a moment, but you, we have uh, by and large a great set of samples, but let's, let's start talking about the, the winners, the class winners. So yeah, Heather has the, has the information, so hang on to it. We don't want them to, I don't want you to, to fast forward, right? Uh, so the, the alfalfa class had 16 samples in it. Third place went to Darren. Stanfield from Lewis County. Darren, if you're here, I'm not going to ask every time. If you're here, stop me, okay? So we can we can embarrass you, okay? All right. It had a combined score, and we we ranked these on the uh, the the sum of protein on a dry matter basis and relative feed value. So remember what we said about 140 being an elite alfalfa, a high quality alfalfa. That means he was probably 20% protein and 140 relative feed value. So our, our third place alfalfa was a high quality alfalfa and we go up from there. The next one is Charles Kleber from Bracken. I don't see David Appleman. And the first place is Bart Hamilton from Bracken, 171 total score, okay? All right, moving on. 34 alfalfa grass samples. I love alfalfa orchard grass, it's my favorite hay. Mark Thomas, and I've been on Mark's farm in Fleming County, 150. Now, one of the things that you gotta keep in mind when you, when you add a grass to alfalfa, I told you that an RFB of 100 for grass is smoking good, right? So a 150 RFB alfalfa, if it's half and half, then Mark's grass is really good for this total, for this score to be 150, okay? Just, just wanted you to know. Second place, Todd Kleber from Bracken and Danny Cooper. From Bracken. Somebody's going to have to to tackle David Appleman and put some weights. You know, we we were if we were horse racing, we we put some weights on his saddle, right? All right, mixed hay, 164 of these. Third place is Charles Grubb in Greenup County, 128 combined score. Randy Powell and Lewis, 132, <clears throat> and Darren Stanfield in Lewis, 134. Tight scores there. Not much difference in score. 201 grass hays, Darren Stanfield, 125.8. And I'm adding tents here because we're gonna need them to separate the, the second and the first place. Perry County, second place, Schoolhouse Branch Farm, 130.7. You were not holding your mouth right that day, Charles, because you beat out by James Mater by, in Johnson County by one-tenth of a point, one-tenth of a point. And folks, that's close, that's close. We gotta go back and see who was working the grinder that day. Somebody may have, you know, <laughs> fudge it, fudge it. All right. Now, summer annual hays. Summer annuals are really hard to make hays. They are my least favorite hay, and I'm not afraid to admit it. They are hard to cure. Big, thick stems for the most part. By the time you get the stems cured, you knock all the leaves off, moving it around the field. That was, of course, I'm a pitiful haymaker. That's what happened to me. Uh, so it's hard to make good hay. And these scores reflect, they're lower. They reflect the fact that there's a lot of fiber in warm season plants, all right? So, and if I'm talking bad about you, is, I hope you're not Charles Grubb. <laughs> Are you Charles Grubb? No, no. Okay, well, I was being a negative Nancy. So we're cousins, I guess. Yeah, so anyway, summer annuals can be tough to make for hay. 
Now, if you can make good hay with summer annuals, I better cover myself. You know, more power to you. You're my hero. Uh, but it, but Charles Grubb in Greenup County was second place with 86. And whoops. And first place is David Horn in Boyd County, Lindell, with a 91 score. Okay, so congratulations to those winners. Now, alfalfa halids, we're switching into the, to the uh, round bale silage wrapped in plastic stuff. We had one entry in the alfalfa halids category, and you could, you know, you could say, oh, well, he could have done anything and, and won that class, and that would have been true, but it was good hay. Jeff Zawadzki and Menifee of 117. Jeff Zawadzki? Oh, well, congratulations, Jeff. All right. All right. Congratulations, Jeff. We have a live winner. I love it. I love it. All right. So um, now looking at alfalfa grass haylage, uh, that we had four samples in that class. Charles Kleber from Bracken was third. Todd from Bracken, Todd Kleber, Bracken was second. And Taylor Saunders from Robertson was first with a 190. You just remember that score because you'll hear that name and score again in a moment. Mixed haylage, uh, we had 23 samples. Of course, that's a grass and legume. Third place, Jim Mullins and Breathitt. Is Jim here? Congratulations, Jim. Mine score of 128. And remember, that's, that's, that's doing really good because uh, again, grasses with the RFV of 100 are smoking good. All right, so congratulations, Jim. Jeff Sawatsky with a 141 mixed haylage. That is, that is outstanding. So, well, well, now that we got a live one in the room, so Jim, tell us about that winning hay sample or haylage sample. <laughs> Well, and, and, and for people that are online and can't, maybe, maybe didn't hear that, uh, he said in spite of his agent and in spite of help from David Ditch, no, no, he didn't. He's, he, he was gracious and credited them with the help of, of getting it cut at the right stage, getting it fertilized, and it, it turned out really good. So, so Jeff, tell us your story. Or let your wife, I'll tell you what, then we'll keep it honest. We'll make your wife tell the story. So, so cutting it at the right stage, getting it up and. Right. Yeah, and and that's so. It, Jeff's point was being able to avoid rain damage, cut it, get it cut at the right stage or close to it, and up in a day, is I mean that's the that's the the biggest driver for making baleage, is to avoid rain damage, biggest one to me, because you've got some pains in the neck dealing with really heavy bales, making sure the plastic is good and stays you know, hole free, uh, you know, you've got to do some things right, but it, there is no other way to make that kind of forage on a reliable basis in Kentucky or with first cuttings. Okay, all right. So first place, Richard Prater in Carter County, 148 combined scores. So those are some really, really top scores. Okay, folks. So uh, let, we've got Jim and we've got uh, Jeff in the room. So let's congratulate them. All right, grass haylage. Third place is Bracken with a 106 total score. Alice and Joey Porter in Fleming is second with 112. Rick Butler in Lewis is, is first place with 115. So uh, those, are, those are good numbers. I told you, pure grass at 100 RFV is really good. 
So these are almost 100, every one of them is probably 100 or, or better on terms of uh, relative feed value uh, with the protein that they've got in them. And so they're, they're very, very good forages. Small grain haylage, and, and small grains are great, uh, but they are the devil to cure for hay. Uh, and we make probably the majority of the baleage that we make in Kentucky, or the majority of the small grains that go into forage get made into haylage in Kentucky. Third place is Taylor Saunders in Robertson County with a 106. Adam McCord in Fleming is second with 114. Bill Stewart and Boyd is first with 126. So uh, those are some really good scores for small grain haylage. Summer annual haylage. And uh, this is where you can take a summer annual and the high yields that you get and actually get the, the energy and the TD into the barn or the, the protein and TD into the barn and not knock all the leaves off, all right? Third place, Mark Ripito in Lewis County with a 92, Buzz Younce in Johnson with a 95. Buzz here? Nope, all right. Tyler Wells from Boyd with a 117. So that's, those are some really, really top scores for summer annuals. Now, the overall champion high score goes to Taylor Saunders in Robertson County, that alfalfa grass haylage with a total score of 190. Ah, now the, the high county average top 10. Lewis was third. Well, let me see if this is gonna come. Oh yeah, okay. This is gonna work out a little bit screwy. Sorry about that. Lewis was third with their top, they, they take the top 10 samples in, in that county and they and we, we take the average of it. So the top 10 samples in Lewis County averaged 140 for total score, awfully good. Second place is Fleming with 144. First place is Bracken with 153. And those are almost the same placings and numbers as last year. So, you know, dethrone them folks, uh, you know, knock them off their throne. That'll be uh, your challenge. And then the top sampler award, the third place goes to Fleming and Lewis together. They both had 61 samples. Boyd County had 65 samples. They're the second most. And Miss Rebecca Kanopka in Carter County had 104. Let me tell you, 104 samples spread across my basement is a lot of the basement, let me tell you. Uh, and so she took 104 samples. Uh, so congratulations, Rebecca. Congratulations to Lyndall and Boyd and uh, April and Fleming uh, and Philip Kanopka in Lewis County. So. Those are the, the top sampler uh, awards for the hay contest. So that's, that's all I have. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, thank you for being a part of the contest. Thank you to the agents for doing tonight, but also then putting this contest together. They've been doing this for more than 20 years. More than 20 years. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop. We can take questions, we can sing a song and go home, it's all good. <laughs>